Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Regina Gong, and welcome to the Open Ed 2021 conference. Today, we are going to talk about our OER feedback survey from our MSU students, its impact, implications, and lessons learned. I am the OER and Student Success Librarian at MSU Libraries, and part of what I do is I lead the OER program, including our OER award program. I also manage our MSU Libraries Open Textbook Publishing via Pressbooks, and I provide professional development to our faculty, our staff, our librarians on open education and open licensing, among others. And I am also facilitating the open pedagogy learning community. Hi everyone, my name is Jason Amariji. I'm the Director of Assessment for the College of Social Science here at MSU. In this role, I do all sorts of things related to program evaluation and assessment of student learning and success in the educational services and programs we uh, offer. My research interests are uh, based on asset-based youth development and student voice and agency. So our MSU, um, our, our um, OER program at MSU is now on its third year. I am the full-time librarian leading the program. And in my team, we have a complete cast that includes uh, our publishing assistant for our print on demand services, um, a, cap a copy editor, an accessibility coordinator, and our student employee who does a lot of our um, covers for our open textbook. And we also have the OER award program wherein we have $50,000 every year that we um, allocate as funding for our faculty to um, adopt adapt and create um, OER. And we are also an institutional member of the Open Education Network. And this year, we are also uh, part of the OpenStax um, Institutional Partnership Program. So our OER program goals are, um, of course, affordability and access. Um, in, we want to encourage adoption, um, adaptation, and creation for, uh, of OER and other low-cost materials as textbook alternative for um, our courses. And in, in our OER program, we also strive to provide technical support for our instructors to implement OER in their courses. And um, as we do now with our open pedagogy learning community, we aim to engage in new pedagogical models that leverages the affordances of OER and open education. So this is just a snapshot of our OER adoption so far. So I've been tracking that since uh, fall 2019. And this is a cumulative um, number of courses, number of sections, and number of instructors that are using OER. So that would be fall, um, spring, and summer for each academic year. And as you can see, it's really growing as we um, you know, go, <laughs> go on with our um, adoptions or our, our program. We have now a cumulative savings of more than $3.2 million as a result of this initiative. In addition to the adoption rates, we wanted to uh, reach out to students and uh, ask them a series of questions through a survey to find out what their experiences are, both with required textbooks, as well as their experiences with OER resources in their courses. And then our, our goal here is to, in the long term, uh, have an understanding of does OER adoption improve student success? So to do this, we are fortunate enough to have access to institutional data, which allows us to identify all those students who are enrolled uh, in those courses that uh, Regina had previously identified. Uh, so we were able to identify those students as well as obtain their email addresses so that we could survey them directly. And so to do that, we built a 12-item survey in Qualtrics. And then with that, we we're able to pair uh, not only the survey data, but we we're also to leverage institutional data to have a better understanding of how 
student background in terms of demographics would play into uh, their results or if there were relationships. And then down the road, we'll be able to look at not only course outcome, but we can look at other metrics in terms of time to degree, persistence, and graduation rate. For that survey, again, we have a 12 item survey. Uh, this is just a sort of a visual diagram of uh, what uh, the survey contains. So we have two threads of uh, information that we asked about. We asked about uh, traditional textbooks uh, in terms of what are the costs, how much have they spent in the past for traditional textbooks? Have there been any impacts related to those costs? We asked them uh, whether or not or how frequently they purchased those textbooks. And then we also ask about open educational resources. Uh, again, these are students enrolled in open educational resource using course. Uh, and so we asked them about the quality of uh, the material within those resources in terms of accuracy, the clarity of the data or information being presented in those resources, and the extent to which they believe that it, there was a positive impact on the learning uh, within the course. And then for both threads of traditional textbooks and OER, we ask about uh, frequency of use and ultimately what is their preference? Uh, do they prefer traditional textbooks or do they prefer OER? Um, and if they had a cho choice of identical courses, uh, would they choose the one within a traditional textbook or an uh, ed open educational resource? There's a lot of data here, so I, I won't go through all of this, but uh, uh, this is all the sample size in terms of uh, uh, the students across all those sections. The enrollment across all OER uh, identified courses uh, for fall 2020 was 8,739 students. Uh, spring, there was 8,353 students. And you can see in terms of unduplicated uh, student samples, so we had students who enrolled in not just one, but two or three different courses that used OER resources. So we deduplicated that sample for the survey just to make students' lives a little bit easier in terms of survey fatigue. And then students actively consented to complete the survey or not. And so you can see the, uh, the, those consent rates. And then we have a small number of students who uh, did not consent uh, to complete the survey. And then as you can see here, we have a large number of students who uh, did not respond to the request uh, to complete the survey. Ultimately, what this means is that uh, we have final response rates of 1,038 students in the fall and 218 students in the spring. Now, I do just wanna take a moment to talk about the spring results because that is incredibly low response rate. Uh, what we found is that in our second semester of being nearly fully remote here at MSU, that by the end of that spring semester, uh, that academic, academic year, uh, students were burned out from uh, completing surveys or online anything. And so while this is a, not an ideal response rate, we still use the data. We did take a look at uh, the extent to which there were differences between uh, respondents in the fall and spring. There were some minor differences related to uh, things that you would expect in terms of students who would be more responsive to taking a survey. Uh, more females than males were likely to take the survey. Students with slightly higher GPAs uh, were more likely to complete the survey. Students uh, who came from an Asian background uh, would be more likely to complete the survey. So all in all, there are some differences there, but we wanted to move forward with maximizing the most amount of survey data that we, we could. And then in our uh, question and answer session, we can talk about moving forward, how we might increase our response rates and whether or not uh, we might be missing groups of students. I wanted to present some of the sample results from the survey. Uh, again, we have 12 items, and so we don't have time to go through all those uh, results, but here in a nutshell is some of them. One of the first questions that we asked was, how often do you purchase required textbooks? And so you can see down here, these were the response options. Student can say, uh, I never uh, purchase uh, required textbooks to rarely, about half the time, often or always. And you can see the distribution here that uh, most students, about a third, or that they often purchase their uh, required textbooks. But what you see here is that, you know, there's a small proportion that say that they never buy their textbooks, required textbooks, or about about 20% who say that uh, they do purchase their textbooks either never or rarely. So we do have students who are not purchasing uh, their required textbooks. The other thing that we wanted to look at is leveraging that institutional data. Uh, so we did a quick analysis uh, looking at for those students who report that they purchase their required textbooks about half the time or less. So it'd be this group of students here. 
Um, we compared all students. And so across the full sample, 40% uh, reported that they purchased uh, the required textbooks about half the time or less. And then you can see how this uh, varies. URM refers to underrepresented minority. Um, but you can see here that uh, it's fairly consistent. Underrepresented minority students have slightly higher, uh, are slightly more likely to purchase about half the time or less. And, but that difference is quite a bit bigger for uh, students who identify as international. I don't believe I, uh, any of these results are statistically significant from each other. And next, we wanted to ask students, to what extent do does the cost of their required textbooks, uh, have they caused any of the following? And so this is just a, a yes, no set of responses. And so Students were asked, uh, has the cost of uh, required textbooks uh, annoyed you, stressed you out, caused you to not purchase the required textbook uh, because you couldn't afford it, caused you to cut on ne uh, non-necessary expenses, things like entertainment, uh, movies going out instead of eating in. And then we asked them, have you had to cut necessary living expenses or uh, delay uh, necessary expenses like paying your rent? Uh, and so you can see the percentages here across all students. And at the very bottom, you can see that uh, only 2.9% of those students reported that uh, the cost of textbooks did not cause one of these uh, feelings or, or behaviors. Majority of students, uh, uh, three quarters, uh, identified as being annoyed or being stressed out by the uh, cost of textbooks, uh, but you can see here uh, nearly a quarter of students uh, reported that they that the cost of textbooks had caused them to cut back on necessary living expenses. So that's that's quite a few students in that sample. Yeah, and so this. Uh, are the quotes that our students told us in our, our survey, and they really appreciate not having to pay for a textbook. This one comes from an international May student um, taking a Math 314 course. And as you can see here, they are very grateful for the fact that they do not have to pay for um, each textbook that they, that they need to. Yes, and this one too is, um, I mean, I'm not going to read this for you, but it, it really goes to show that, um, you know, what, what our students are experiencing in terms of um, how uh, the textbook is being used. So, you know, sometimes they, they feel that it's not, unnecessary, it's not necessary to use a textbook to get an A in the course. Um, and so uh, we also wanted to take a look at how cost impact may have uh, affected students differently or uh, students from different backgrounds differently. And so again, to the left, you can see the, what the question was, has the cost of required textbooks or required course materials caused you to cut back, limit, make late payments on necessary living expenses, food, housing, transportation, and the like. And so it's just that one option. Uh, and you can see here, again, these uh, set of students, all students, about a quarter, as I identified before, but you can see as different types of students had differential responses here. Pell eligibility, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's this is a family income-based financial aid package. And so uh, we use this here at MSU as an, a proxy for socioeconomic status. Students who are eligible for Pell grants uh, tend to come from uh, family backgrounds that uh, have fewer resources. Um, and so you can see here that I uh, uh, it would make a little bit of sense that I, uh, those students who come from lower means, uh, economic means, are disproportionately impacted by uh, the cost of required textbooks. Um, but you can see that it affects uh, students uh, from underrepresented minority status, as well as first generation status uh, differentially. And again, these are some of what our students are saying in terms of the impact of the cost of textbook um, on them. And um, as you can see here, we have, you know, we, we made it so that we have a profile, you know, of the students who are giving us their um, feedback. So um, in this case, um, we have um, Hispanic female first generation and Pell eligible student. And, you know, based from um, the feedback, it has really helped them this semester. And yeah, so our next slide. 
it's a lot to read so i'm not gonna read it and yeah so this one is all you know too familiar not having to pay for textbook really relieves stress on on them and um they wish that they you know more classes are offering courses that are using oer Another section of the survey, we asked students, how do they use their OER resource in their course? And we, we asked three questions about how they use it. So we asked if they uh, print the entire textbook, uh, have it printed by an external uh, printing company. Uh, do they print out uh, sets of pages or chapters on their own? Uh, and then uh, do they copy and paste uh, electronically parts of the textbook uh, into a separate notes document or a study guide. And you can see the proportion here, uh, about 10% report that they have the open educational resource printed, 15% uh, uh, will print it out, and 31% uh, report that they copy and paste. And so I think that uh, what, we've, what we take away here is that part of the utility of these open educational resources is not that they can be printed and used as a printed resource, but they're, uh, they remain an electronic resource. Students leverage that, uh, the digital copies of that for their uh, study benefits. We next asked uh, to what extent they, we asked about the quality of the, the resources in their course. And so the three questions we asked are, uh, I, uh, was the textbook presented, uh, did the textbook or open educational resource present the information accurately? I, I, was it uh, presented in a clear and understandable way? Uh, and then uh, did the open educational resource support your learning of the course material? And you can see across the board, very high percentages of students either agreed or strongly agreed with these statements. And then we asked a second question about quality, comparing the open educational resource to their experiences with traditional textbooks. And this is uh, the chart on the left. Uh, and so we asked them, would you rate, how would you rate the open educational resource? Was it worse than other textbooks or those required textbooks? Uh, was it about the same as those other textbooks or was it better? And you can see here, the majority of students reported, 60% reported that it was about the same. And then uh, if you combine about the same and better, it's about, what is that, 60, 70, 80, 90, 94%. Uh, so uh, the majority, vast majority of uh, students report that their open education resource was as good, if not better than uh, traditional textbooks. And then uh, we asked students if they uh, were given a choice of two different sections of a course that had is the same material, sa same instructor and the same course, uh, but they had a choice uh, and, and equally desirable time slots uh, for those two choices, which would they choose? Would they choose the course with a traditional printed textbook? Uh, would they choose the course with the OER resource, the open textbook, or would they not have a preference? And as you can see, figures, uh, students do have a preference. Uh, they would prefer their the course with a OER resource. Yeah, and in here, our students are telling us um, feedback regarding the resource itself. Um, they love the, the book. It's very helpful. It's organized well, and it's very comprehensible. And yeah, it's just as good, if not better, than any of their the textbook, commercial textbooks that they use in their other classes. Um, and this one is from a female URM, Pell eligible student. Um, yeah, it, the course using um, an OER for this course is really very beneficial for, for her learning and um, education. When we, when we step back and take a 30,000 foot perspective of the survey results, obviously we've not presented all the results here, but I, here are some of the takeaways of what we learned from what students had to say about their experiences with traditional textbooks, as well as their open educational resources. And so students uh, clearly identified that uh, traditional textbooks are expensive, that uh, even when they're required for a course, they're not often use or that they're not used fully. And especially for older students or students who are in their third or fourth year, increasingly they're less likely to purchase those textbooks. They identify alternative means to access their information or have realized which courses uh, you can still do well in without uh, using 
are purchasing that, that traditional textbooks. Students are uh, not only stressed, but they're irritated by the cost of uh, traditional textbooks. And part of that is because uh, they're, they're having to make cuts in other aspects of their life to, in order to afford those textbooks. And then I, I often I related to increasingly not purchasing textbooks. What we saw is that uh, students, especially as they progress in their academic career, become sophisticated consumers of those textbooks. They do the cost benefit analysis of, you know, do I want to spend $250 on a textbook or, you know, am I, uh, will I uh, fare well without it? And increasingly, again, they, they do not purchase those uh, uh, textbooks. And then in terms of the uh, open educational resources, uh, students identify as, as, as them having at equal quality or they're uh, better. They're easier to access. Again, students uh, often talked about the convenience of being able to, to use the find feature within an electronic resource so they can search for a key term or search for a particular chapter, especially if that resource is allowed during test taking. And then there's more functionality within those ed open educational resources. Uh, within the digital domain, there can be added functionality in terms of widgets or links to videos. Um, and so students did identify uh, those as uh, helpful for their learning. We're going to continue uh, administering student surveys. Uh, we're going to create and implement a faculty survey to see what faculty have to say. And then uh, long-term goals are to take close, a close look at how open educational resources uh, uh, impact student su success metrics. So things like, you know, not only course grades, but their cumulative GPA, uh, are they more likely to persist because they can afford college? And then, uh, of course, that relates to uh, uh, graduation rates, our time to degree, um, and then of course, course drop rates. Uh, we did hear from one student in a, one of the quotes that they dropped one course that had a tra traditional textbook to take one with an open educational resource. Uh, and then of course, as we're doing today, uh, we're going to continue disseminating the results to stakeholders, not only academic communities, but also student, students, administrators, uh, and then folks in the field. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. I hope uh, you learned something from our presentation. We'll be happy to um, answer any questions as we um, all collectively view this presentation. Thank you so much.